Rwanda can be surprising. Nature in Rwanda is raw and powerful. The natural ecosystems are unique and precious. And they contain some of the rarest of animals. But one species has degraded the landscape by unsustainable farming and by the most extreme forms of conflict and turmoil. Could this story of light and shadow yet have a miraculous end? Rwanda is one of the poorest and most densely populated countries in the world. And its recent history is overshadowed by one of the most tragic events in human history. At 27,000 square kilometers, Rwanda may be a tiny country, but its ecosystems are fascinating and important. I've come to Rwanda to see what its environmental future may be. Within Nyungwe National Park, strictly protected by the government, is an amazing primary forest. Nsinge is part of a team who help conserve these hills and valleys, a functional ecosystem with some of the most astonishing biodiversity in the heart of Africa. As you can see, it's really fabulous in terms of you can see the different habitat from the canopy and mountain. It's a wonderful attraction for tourists, one for the beauty by seeing, by looking at the the physical features, mountains and then the valley, the swamp, but also the swamp area contains all the home for different species. This is the largest uh, mountainous forest remaining in this region, the Arbutin Rift. And having different species, biological species, which are endemic, which can only be found in this area. And for instance, looking up about primates, it's in this area where you can have these uh, uh, chimpanzees in huge number. The chimpanzees and other primates are living icons of the highland forest. Famed primatologist Diane Fossey lived and died in the Rwandan rainforest, studying one of the rarest of species, the mountain gorilla. Kambogo is the chief tourism warden of this forest sanctuary. Now, it is said that 70% of the waters in Rwanda come from Nyungwe. The rivers flowing in the east feed the river Nile. Then the rivers flowing in the west feed the river Congo. There are many springs in the park, and we are still even discovering more because of the impenetrable parts of the forest. When you come into a natural environment like this African rainforest here in Rwanda, you can't help but notice the differences in humidity, temperature, and even the levels of oxygen. The difference between this and human-altered environments is the profusion of biodiversity, the enormous quantities of biomass, and everywhere here is decaying organic matter. The biodiversity, the water, and the soil fertility, which come from the Rwandan forest, don't just nourish the wildlife. The thriving tea plantations depend on the water that flows from the forests, as do all the farmers. The Rwandan hills and mountains are what is known as a highland water tower. Traditionally, when the heavy rains come every year, the vast forest filters the water and regulates its flow. The water here is not only used by, by, by Rwandese. It goes throughout the Africa, it goes up to Egypt. 
This going in Congo River. And in the east, it goes to the, the Nile River. And that, no one understands that if what is going there, it, come, it is coming from somewhere. It's coming from a functional system. But if instead of conserving the forest, humans denude the vegetation and degrade the land, the water often floods, causing havoc across the region. Rwanda is a land of tremendous natural beauty and ecological importance. But its recent past includes one of the most brutal chapters in contemporary human history. In 1994, perhaps as many as a million people were brutally murdered in a genocidal frenzy that took place over a hundred days. This is a lesson in the worst of human potential, and it's a lesson that can never be forgotten, it must never be repeated. This is a story of hope, but it unfolds in shadow. Estimates vary between 800,000 and 1 million people who died in this heartbreaking tragedy. The pictures here are being brought here by the families of the victims, uh, some of the, them who survived. They continue bringing the pictures of the victims from their family. The people who are buried here, many of them are from the Shigari city. Uh, they were exhumed to be rebuilt in human dignity. The total number is more than 260,000 genocide victims that are buried in these graves. So we can now um, go and uh, pay respect to one of the mass graves on our way down here. Genocide is a part of, unfortunately, part of our history. Uh, we have to live with it, but we don't want to be held prisoners of that sad aspect of our history. Genocide not only ravaged the human psyche, but scarred the land itself. In the turmoil that followed the genocide, millions of displaced people physically destroyed vast swathes of Rwanda's unprotected forests. Dr. Rose Mukan Komeji remembers what the Geshwati forest was like when she was a girl. That was before the genocide, before the over-farming, and before much of the escalating population growth. My goodness, it was green, it was a forest. I used to come from the south here to go to the just to Nyundo place. We used to pass one hour and a half traveling this Gishwati. But now, it is not even 10 minutes. Everything has gone specifically because of this pressure of population on natural resources. We see behind me the remaining forest of Gishwati, which we used to cover the whole area from here to Mo, to Rubavu district, Nyabihu district. Actually, Gishwati used to be linked with uh, Volcano Park and the Nyungwe Forest before we've done a lot of degradation. Before genocide, this forest was here, but it has been invaded as a consequence of the genocide. So genocide has taken our lives, our loved people, friends, relatives, but also it has affected the environment. So people, they came, they go, they, they, they went where they, they, they could find. So now, the degradation of environment has been huge because of the conflict passed through. Around 2007, we started having landslides and we've lost actually the ecological function. Now people have been moved from the other side of this Gishkwati because of landslide, because they, they, 
it is not functioning. It is not sustainable. We are facing floods in the city of Kigali this just morning. We have to recover the functions. What you see here is replicated around the world. Hundreds of millions of people farm for survival and degrade fragile environments. And this is expected to get worse with climate change and population growth. The fate of these people and the fate of the environment are intimately intertwined. If this goes on for yet more decades and generations, the outcomes will become more and more dire. This is a problem begging for a solution. It is daunting for both man and nature to emerge from these shadows, but it is possible. We experienced the genocide, but uh, at the same time, our capacity to raise uh, from uh, that delicate and that uh, desperate situation actually puts us in a position where we are starting to be perceived as, uh, I would say, an exceptional people. And uh, how can all the Rwandans be part of uh, that, uh, that, that, that campaign? The Rwandan government and people have embarked on a huge experiment seeking to rapidly alter centuries of degradation that has impoverished the land and forced individuals and communities to compete for scarce resources. The government's plan is to transition subsistence agriculturalists to new sustainable livelihoods. And the first step on this path is the creation of new villages called Umudagudu in Kenya, Rwanda. This is the village of Rubaya in Rwanda near the Ugandan border. Some of the poorest people in the country live here. They're trying a concept to see whether it's possible to reduce poverty by actively improving the environment. Alex Mulisa works with the United Nations to help develop this experimental village. The concept uh, is intended to bring uh, poor families together uh, in this Umudugudu as a way of spurring uh, economic development for this Umudugudu uh, to lift them up from poverty. <laughs> the local community determined that this place was suitable for houses and they prepared the land. Then they built the houses. The people who were living along the road were told that they had to move and live here. And then they built the houses for the poor returning people. Uh, so this was brought together as an integrated environmental management and the poverty reduction. And the two concepts will emerge to demonstrate that actually uh, you can uh, address poverty uh, through ecosystem management, enhancing agricultural production, ensuring that there is sufficient water, even in the dry spells, uh, to be able to provide water for irrigation and to reduce the distance that uh, uh, poor women and the children have to travel to look for water for domestic purposes. There are too many advantages to name them all, but we get houses water capture and storage nearby. Before we had to carry water from far away, now it's much closer to the house. These terraces serve a number of purposes, including um, interventions for soil erosion. You can see that uh, the topography here is really hilly, and as a result, when it rains, uh, the soil topsoil, which for the most part has is higher in fertility, washes down the, the valleys. So the terraces are providing that intervention. But much more importantly, the terraces have proven to enhance uh, production. A bonus for moving to the villages. Every family will now have a cow.
My first wish is if they can give us a cow. I believe if we have a cow we can get milk for the children and pay their school fees. Our lives will be better. The Poverty Environment Initiative, as it is called, is a step forward toward linking ecological function and human well-being. But will it work? To try and find out, Alex traveled to neighboring Kenya to meet Dr. Renee Holler, a pioneer in restoring damaged ecosystems. Dr. Holler's own experiment began in a cement factory quarry. Hard to find a landscape more ravaged, not even any soil. His challenge to restore the ecosystem, to bring the quarry back to the garden. The basic thing was I saw that I have a, a jigsaw puzzle, but most of the pieces were missing. And so I was setting out for my vision, which I had, and a, a total ecosystem to, to be built. So I needed all these bits and pieces, which I learned slowly, slowly. I, what I did was actually just giving it nature a helping hand. His work was inspired by an unlikely creature, the red-legged millipede, which eats the fallen needles of the casuarina pine, creating humus and fertile soil in the once barren rock quarry. So then we introduced them into the quarry, but after a very short time, we had actually had then, uh, they established themselves very well. And now in the best parts uh, where the, the soil is not washed off, we had up to 10 centimeters of, of humus. Dr. Holler's work has shown that by restoring vegetation cover and biodiversity, it is possible to retain the vital water needed in the ground. That means overcoming drought and arid conditions that have become so common in Africa where vegetation cover has been lost. Uh, what happened now, there's hardly a place in these quarries down there which has no vegetation. There's grass, there's trees, everything. Before, you know, it was uh, two and a half square kilometers of, of, of desert. 1,000 hectares being rehabilitated from uh, bare, uh, non soil areas um, is to us brings some hope that uh, there, is, there is something that can be done for Rwandan soils. Over the years, Dr. Holler has expanded his work to show how the principles of restoration he has pioneered can help small farmers like those in Rwanda. So we all go for things which, we, which the farmers can do themselves. Right, know? right. We started with a little biogas system on the other side that's mm -hmm. experimental right. uh, with, with, with the drums, which are right. uh, very simple. And then we had the next one was then the biogas system which we have uh, tubes. Because we found not everybody has got cows or manures, you know, uh, mm -hmm. but, but they, have, um, they have got vegetation right. which mm -hmm. they can use then. That's after it's food for the chickens and the fish again. And the fish, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so nothing goes to it. Yeah. <laughs> That's recycling at its best. Uh, <laughs> each kid in, in our outstations have got right. the tire. That's their shamba. Right. That's our fish nursery. There's actually the big fish. Right. And then the small fish, they, they come, come in here. Because the water from the, from the well has to go through the fish tanks first. Right. And then, what is very interesting, because uh, the fish fecal matter is the best fertilizer you can get. The most important thing is to, as fast as possible, get vegetations, uh, vegetation to grow. And uh, that can be, again, uh, done in, in very adverse areas. Alex is fascinated by what he has seen. I've been involved in this program uh, from an environmental management standpoint, but uh, never before has it come out so clearly to me that actually large-scale ecosystem rehabilitation on a national scope is possible. At the Hora Park, I have seen ecosystem rehabilitation take place actually from initial conditions that are much worse than what we would be dealing with in Rwanda. Back in Rwanda, the lesson that it is possible to restore degraded lands is great news. But Rwanda faces special challenges because here there are so many people living from the land. The government has had some tough choices to make. Should the people simply be helped to be better subsistence farmers 
or should many be encouraged to leave farming altogether? The decision will affect the future of millions. We want to get quite a sizable number of them out of agriculture, and this is one of the solution, solutions that we are contemplating to ensure that our environment indeed can sustain uh, all the economic activities that uh, have been identified as the drivers of uh, the national economy. The decision to try and reduce the numbers of people in subsistence agriculture is dramatic and controversial. Now we have managed to put them in this small village. We need to improve it. And maybe next time if you came, they have water, they have electricity. So maybe we can lead. But right now, we still have to work very, very hard. In order to reverse degradation, to restore fertility, and to naturally regulate the water, the weather, and the climate, it is necessary to revegetate the country and continuously accumulate organic matter. In this task, nature can help, because generating large amounts of vegetation in the tropical highlands of Rwanda is what nature wants to do as well. is to make sure that we have mapped all those degraded ecosystems and starting by rehabilitating them so they can recover their functions. So I think if we manage to make sure that Jishwati is rehabilitated, maybe why not Rugezi, why not all those hills which are very empty when we can forest them, plant food, we can be a leader. We can't be a leader when we only talk. All this talk about restoration is certainly good for the chimpanzees. One new fertile corridor of restored forest will connect isolated chimps in Geshwati with the larger community of chimps in Nyungwe National Park. For the chimps, a corridor of love. The expected distance between two forests is 50 kilometers, and we pray to build a corridor of one kilometer of width. Because in, in Nyungwe, there is a large population of chimpanzees, and in Ijishwati, as we have only 15, we hope that they can cross and interbreed. Before starting conserving Ijishwati, people were calling this forest, the forest uh, beyond hope. Now Jishwat is called the Forest of Hope. This doesn't apply to Rwanda only. Indeed, in the past, people have made a lot of mistakes. The consequences the planet is facing are due to that. How do we rectify that? Uh, the, the only way is to ensure that uh, any programs or any actions that uh, are geared to achieving development have to be soundly uh, relying on proper management of the environment. We consider that without uh, sustainable environment, we can't develop, that's a fact. The Rwandan government has made great strides in understanding how the country can contribute to both mitigate and adapt to human-induced climate change. This has led to new policies and actions that is making Rwanda an example for many other countries with similar problems. The Rwanda Forest Landscape Restoration Initiative, designed to restore all degraded land in the country, was formally announced in New York at the United Nations Forum on Forests in February 2011. In Rwanda, the country and the people have endured an oppressive colonial past, civil war, an almost unfathomable genocide, and environmental degradation. Now, in their efforts to emerge from poverty and restore ecological function over broad areas of the country, 
the Rwandan people are striving to show the world what is necessary to heal the earth and the human spirit. I would like to see our kids, grandchildren, living in an environment in a country where it is good, it is environmentally healthy, economically healthy, and having the imbalance between the two.